Welcome to the Alfred L. Pierce Generating Station. I'm Raymond Smith, Director of Public Utilities for the Town of Wallingford. In creating this video tour, we thought we'd share with the local residents a little bit of the history of the power plant and the Wallingford Electric Division. The Electric Division, formerly known as the Borough Electric, initially began providing electricity in 1899. So as we enter into the 100th year of operation, we felt it was appropriate to talk about some of the events in the beginning of the electric operation and also to show people in Wallingford the Alfred Pierce Station. First of all, Wallingford's power plant is named for the first manager of the Wallingford electric system. Alfred Pierce was there when electricity first flowed in Wallingford. Something we take for granted today was a luxury back then. Under his leadership, the system grew as more and more folks signed up with the Borough Electric. The original power plant, which today houses the Wallingford Senior Center, last generated electricity regularly early in the 1920s. For approximately 25 years thereafter, Wallingford relied totally on purchase power from private utilities in the area. After World War II, the leaders of the Wallingford Borough Electric recommended building a new power plant. In 1950, a decision was made to expend more than three and a half million dollars to construct a then modern power plant on the E Street property owned by the Borough of Wallingford. The site was formerly used as Wallingford's airport in prior years. The new plant was completed in 1953 and dedicated to Alfred L. Pierce. The power plant was rated at 22,500 kilowatts at peak load, which was more than two and a half times the load served by the Borough Electric around 1950. The Alfred Pierce plant was originally a coal-fired operation. In the late 1970s, it was converted to oil fire generation in order to comply with air emission regulations that were adopted in the 1960s and 70s. Early in its service, the plant produced all of the electricity needed by the town's customers. However, electrical usage after 1950 grew at an annual rate of 7% per year. Demands doubled approximately every 10 years. By the middle 1960s, the plant could not meet the peak loads of the borough electric system. After that time, the borough resumed buying bulk energy through wholesale power contracts with the Pierce plant supplementing those purchases. As the load continued to grow, Pierce continued to function as a peak shaving plant. The power plant has continued to operate in recent years only on a limited schedule during very hot weather to help the New England power grid. In 1965, the Pierce plant was running on November 9th. That date is significant because it's the night in which the power went out for most of the northeastern region of the United States. Major cities like New York went completely dark while Wallingford maintained electric supply to its users. Wallingford was one of the few areas that had lights on that infamous night. Interestingly enough, the power plant was online at the time of the Northeast blackout, but had the plant not been running, it would not have been able to fire up on its own. The Pierce plant never had what is called Black Star capability. Fortunately for local users, the Pierce plant was online at the time and successfully disconnected from the troubled transmission grid. Now, Let's get a tour of Wallingford's landmark, led by our plant superintendent, Peter Volomans. This is the main operating level of Pier Station. The equipment here to my right are the three turbo generators. But before we go on our tour, let me show you on a schematic how Pier Station functions. This is a schematic of a major cycle at Pier Station. Um, Pier Station is a 22 and a half megawatt power plant. It's oil fired, number four oil. Um, number four oil is burned in the boilers right here. Fuel oil is fired in the boilers to produce steam, which in turn is used by the turbo generators. Um, the steam that comes out of the superheater is about 825 degrees 
The steam enters the turbine at around 825 degrees and exits the turbine at around 110, 120 degrees. The steam is then led through a condenser which is cooled to condense the steam back to water which is then reused in the cycle. The condensate pumps take suction out of the condenser hot wells, runs it through the air ejector condensers, through the first stage heater or low pressure heater, LP heater, into the DA tank or deaerating feed water heater. The feed pump takes suction and push the water at about 800 to 850 pounds per square inch through the HP heater back through the boiler through an economizer which is a last stage heater. This concludes the cycle. Now let's take a walk through Pier Station so I can show you the actual components. This is the turbine control panel. It shows the uh, operating status of the turbine while we're generating. We have a vacuum monitor here. We have throttle pressure over here. First stage pressures. Down here we have the boiler control panel. Uh, shows the burner pressures, alarms, several alarm points, which burners are ignited and lit. Superheater outlet pressures. Capacity monitor, excess air, this is the front of number two boiler, these are the old coal stokers that are no longer used. This is the burner front of number two boiler. Pier station has three boilers. Each boiler has four burners, and we burn about 1,000 gallons per hour in each boiler. This is the DA tank, a fairly important uh, piece of equipment in the feed water system. It removes the air from the feed water. On top of this tank, we have the vent condenser. This is level 109, also known as the pipe gallery. All the steam from the boilers enters this main header and is then distributed to the turbines. It's a cross-connect system, which means that number two boiler can be used for number three turbine. These are the surge tanks. They're basically feed water storage tanks. There's three of them. And we're also on the highest level at Pier Station, giving us a wonderful view of Wallingford. This is the coal gallery and has not been used for many, many years. Uh, this was used when the Pier Station was burning coal. The coal was brought up through conveyor belt. And you can see that here with a newly bricked area and then dumped into the bunkers over here. These are the boiler feed pumps. We have two motor-driven boiler feed pumps, one steam turbine-driven feed pump. These pumps take suction out of the DA tanks and discharge through the HP heaters to the boilers. This is the number two HP heater, high-pressure feed water heater. In order to obtain proper atomization at the burner tips, we need to heat the fuel, and we do that with these fuel oil heaters. This is the condenser. The condenser is a large heat exchanger that transfers heat from one fluid to another. Underneath the condenser, we have the hot well and condensate pumps. These are the circulating pumps. Uh, we have six pumps here, each rated at 5,000 gallons per minute. 
Uh, they provide cooling water for the turbines low boil coolers and the main condensers. These are the air ejectors and they remove air and non-condensable gases from the condenser. We're back at the main operating level and now that we've seen the interior, let's take a look outside. To my left, uh, we have the fuel oil tanks. Uh, they are uh, 20,000 gallons apiece. They're double walled. Uh, fuel oil is delivered through this piping system right here to the boilers. We're approaching the rear of the building, and here we'll see some equipment that the local residents don't see that often. Here we have the economizers, the air heaters, force draft blowers and induced draft fans, which discharge through this ducting to the smokestack. Let's take a look at the cooling tower. We're on top of the cooling tower. The cooling tower's primarily function is to provide cooling water for the main condensers and the lube oil coolers. These structures you see here are the exhaust fans that aid in the cooling process. The south end of the cooling tower, we have the switch yard associated with pier station. We have two high lines coming in, 1630 and 1640 line. Now Bill Caminos, the general manager of the electric division, will provide additional information on the distribution side. I'm standing in the control room of the Pierce Power Plant. This control room is manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week by our power plant operators. They receive calls from the outside when there is power outages, uh, not only with the electric division, but the water and sewer division uh, also. Uh, the power plant operators uh, have use of a SCADA system that they can monitor the condition of our system at the time of a power outage. They could do switching, opening and closing of circuits, and therefore maintain some sort of reliability to our uh, 40,000 uh, residents of, of Wallingford. Uh, we're going to be putting a new SCADA system in, uh, in the short term, and uh, look forward to having a more contemporary system. Let me take you to our uh, generation uh, switchboard. I'm standing in front of two circuit breakers in the Pierce Power Plant. These two breakers serve two feeders that go out into our community, two distribution feeders. We have a total of 38 distribution feeders in three substations that are strategically located in the town of Wallingford. The Wallingford Electric Division and the Pierce Power Plant has provided safe, reliable service for many years. We look forward to meeting the challenges in the future for our customers.